Hey, it's Jason, and I'm gonna film volume three of Incredibly Useful Exercises today. I've been practicing this for about a week, and I'm really enjoying these volumes. It's kind of making my practice feel a little bit more like a story with a beginning and a middle and an end, and I just really like the way that Dennis Whitaker has laid these out. There are 16 volumes, so I'm trying to just go through each one, and a lot of the exercises do come back, so I've described some of them. I might describe them in a little less detail, or talk about something different. They're all exercises that have a lot of depth, and this third volume is starting to get into a little bit more demanding technical territory, I'll just say, but it doesn't matter where you are on the base. You can modify these, and I'll show you some ways that you can do that to tailor this to your own practicing. I think with some imagination, this is a great way for anybody, no matter where they are on the base, certainly for professionals, but also for students and even beginners if you take some imagination and thought on it. So let's get this camera on the head. And I loosened the strap this time so that hopefully I won't get a headache. About 45 minutes in, I usually have been getting a headache. And I make sure I get the good audio going here. That's going. And now I did not get this going at the beginning of last video. So I'm making sure this goes. Uh, so we can talk through what's on the iPad. Hopefully this is helpful for folks. And then last step is I like to get my app Modacity, which I totally love. Uh, shout out to Modacity. I will try to link up to everything I talk about in this video. So I'll try to link up to Modacity in some capacity. I lost my practice streak. I decided to take the weekend off from practicing for whatever reason. Don't necessarily recommend that. But I must say it's Tuesday today. I came back Monday and I practiced for one day and I felt pretty pretty good. Uh, I felt refreshed. And so it is a good idea, no matter what you're doing, to take some time off, depending on where you are uh, in your practicing journey. But I'm going to open up my playlist for Incredibly Useful Exercises, Volume 3, Hand Shaping and Precision. So the I get, I'll get my bass here while I'm talking. So the idea, oh yeah, and again, I often practice with the practice mute. I won't for this video, but uh, I think there's some benefit to it. So this is a book where th this volume will probably take a little bit more out of you physically, and it is more oriented toward the left hand, but not completely oriented toward the left hand. Uh, Dennis has these affirmations, which I think is a great idea. I'm just using the Kindle app right here on the iPad, so I can't really... Um, write, I can't write on it, uh, but that's okay. Uh, I would probably recommend the paper version, although these Kindle versions are great too, and they're very convenient, and you can write somewhere else. So uh, if you haven't watched these other videos, what I do is these are designed, uh, Dennis says that these are designed to take about an hour. I've built a timed playlist, uh, generally giving myself around three or four minutes for each one of these. Um, I, in my own practicing on this volume, I've, I, I I probably need to tweak some of these because some of these I've given myself more time and not, and also knowing I'm going to talk through these. So I, I probably won't stick exactly to these times today, but they'll be relatively close. So uh, we will just go through those and I'll show you what, what we got here. Again, we start and we end with silence. Um, and Dennis again has this, this, uh, code up here, these these ratings of how, how long they take, the control, mindfulness, expression, power, velocity, coordination, and endurance. This is all really useful information. And if you have the paper book, you're going to see the music and you're going to see this page right there. So I'm going to start up my um, modacity routine. So I give myself a minute and a half to tune, rosin, and get set. I may need to change the wording on this. Uh, or maybe not. We'll see. So I typically, here's my rosin leatherwood bespoke. I love this stuff. Uh, I did a video review about this, or I've done a couple. I will try to remember <laughs> to link to those. Um, but I don't put my rosin on right away. I just play and I sort of see where I am in my rosin levels. And I usually like to play a little bit before I add fresh rosin, just to give it a chance to warm up. Um, and speaking of warming up, I'm here in San Francisco, the sun, it's been a very stereotypical San Francisco day. The sun finally uh, poked its head out. It's about 9.40 AM. So uh, let's check our tuning. And if it's in the green, when I'm playing with the bow, I'm generally happy. Okay, so it's a little sharp, bring that down. A, E, uh. That's always this extension, low B extension. I always have like, 
pitch creep. <laughs> okay, so we're more or less set and go back to this and we start with a little bit of silence. Oh, I'm trying to get nice and centered, although we do have a centering exercise in a moment. So a little bit of silence. great way to just kind of clear the mind. I really am growing to like doing that. I should, I should do that more. And I love Dennis's. Uh, it gives us a little B major here in our exercise of silence. And again, he provides resources for all these sort of things. Uh, so now we move on to centering, which I really enjoy this exercise. Um, and I was outside doing email for the last hour or so, and I'm pretty cold, actually, that my body temperature, my hands are feeling kind of kind of not warmed up. So I'm gonna really try to focus on these body parts. And so I start with my feet. And then I think about my knees and my hips. And what I do is I don't take a breath where Dennis says breathe. I just focus on my breath. So now lower back, shoulder blades. Take as long as you want in these notes. Think about your breath. And I check in with this muscle group and I just release my face. Learn <laughs> to relax while I'm talking. Move over to my right shoulder, right elbow. We're just checking in with these body parts. Right wrist, right fingers. And if my pitch is funky, I'm not worried so much about that right now. This is an awareness exercise. You gotta pick what you're gonna focus on when you practice. There are 20,000 things to think about, so right now we're just checking in with these body parts. Breathe. Whole body, it's kind of like I'm in Star Trek being beamed up. Just my arms, and then focus on my breath. And throughout this routine, I'm going to probably take a lot more breaks than I did the first two. In fact, I, I will, um, because some of these are uh, relatively demanding physically or quite demanding physically. And so we're, we're trying to push our, we're trying to build capacity, and, but not uh, injure ourselves. So we really need to be careful of that. Like I'm trying to build up my running speed, uh, not my running speed, my running distance in my life. I've, I've, I, I took some time off during this stinking pandemic and then I've been getting into it and I finally decided to to go further, but it's a slow process, right? I go just a little, a quarter mile more, a quarter mile more, listen to my body. So it's very similar when you're doing this kind of practicing. So tonalization is, uh, I think this has happened in every routine so far, and this is very cool. So it's just taking the string and replicating with the bow, the physical effect that you get with a pizzicato, that's my interpretation. So I'm grabbing the string, engaging the string, probably a better word, and then releasing it. So can I then do that with the bow? And I'm really trying to look at how my arm moves, kind of moves like that. Can I do that? Similar motion. Make those two sounds as similar as possible. Like if it's a ta, this would be a ta really thinking about the articulation. Then we move over, and so that was these right here. Now we are doing just a series of these catch and release, set and release. Going for clarity. Ugh, I have to clean my bridge. But don't get distracted, Jason. Keep, keep going. Do a few more of those. Really go for set and then clarity. Base maintenance has not been great during the pandemic. Uh, hopefully soon. Okay, so that now we do half notes. 
So we just, we still engage the string and we just have a little more bow. And I'm going for about half the bow. And I'm really thinking about setting and then sending the energy this direction. Now we lengthen it, so now we're doing dotted halves, one, two, three, release, set, two, three, release, set, two, three, release, set. And when I set, I feel it in all four fingers, and, and then as I go out in the bow, I slowly uh, engage uh, in a pronation motion as I go out. So now we are doing just straight up whole notes. Four. And so on and so forth. I realize I'm out of time. But then I would finish. And I actually really like the way Dennis finishes this with pizzicato. It's like closing the chapter. And that's part of what I really like about these exercises. And then he always writes center. So you got center at the end of these exercises. Uh, great, great way to just frame thinking about starting things the right way. It's just, it's, this is just like, uh, like I read the daily stoic every day. Um, just to kind of set my mind right, hopefully right ish for the day. And I think of these as very similar exercises. Okay. Frame survey. So what uh, I'll get this going, but, um, I'm gonna pause for a second, just to explain what a frame is. So a frame uh, uh, is the spacing between the lowest and the highest finger for each position. So first position, which probably most are familiar with right here, this is the frame. Here's a frame. Now the thing is, our hand can really open only about yay wide, right? And if we use our thumb, we can maybe, op we, can, we can bring that frame a little wider. But now, as we move up the base, and this is what this exercise does, as we move up the base, the amount of notes in each frame expands. So we've still got this same span or this span here, but as we go up the bass, you know, if you think about frets on a fretboard, they're getting closer and closer together on a guitar and it's the same principle, certainly on a bass. So by the time we're here, we've got a, we got an octave basically that we can play here. It's a whole step. So this exercise makes no sense harmonically, but it makes a ton of sense just in terms of the way it lies on the bass. And now uh, it, it goes, goes through all the Raboth positions. So quick primer on that if you're not familiar. First position is just first position. And it does the same finger pattern uh, across. So I think basically every method calls this first position. You know, just a whole step up from the nut. Now Raboth's second position is between C and D and the G string. I'll just talk about G string notes. And by the way, there's a harmonic there. So first position, second position, third position from D to this G. So here's this frame, which I'm getting at this moment by pivoting or opening my hand. I could also get by going like this, lots of different ways to do it. I think Dennis just frames it like this for this exercise, but the Raboth technique would be from here to here. That would be first, second, third, fourth, is this distance here, G to D. Fifth, D to G. Sixth, everything else, and that includes all these harmonics up here. So Dennis just runs through all these positions in this exercise. And again, it doesn't make sense harmonically, but it's a great way of just kind of like, like he says, it's a survey of these different positions, just sort of checking in. So we start here and go at your, I do not go fast on this when I'm starting out, even though I know these relatively well. So. Open one four across the strings. Now second position. Third position. Fourth position. And even though he could go up to the high D right now, he's just kind of getting the hand set. 
so no pivots. So now here we have from D to G. We've got those four notes. And this note is the same as this note. So you're going to hear two Ds right there. I'm going to move slightly out of the sun. Uh, I'm glad the sun came out, but it's now uh, jacking up the video. So, okay. So uh, we are here. And let's see, he goes, he just turns it right around. So he's, he's here. See, I sort of lost my, my bearing there. So that's where I'm not, I'm not obliging myself. I'm not, I'm not obligating myself is maybe the right word to stay in tempo on these. I, I screwed up. So I slow it down. I go back to that moment and I just sort of like take the needle back and forth on that as slow as I want, just trying to internalize. And so I keep running back down the bass. And the point of this is to just almost like see laser frets on these main points. So your hand just kind of like, one of the biggest challenges is we just have this big black expanse of unmarked nothingness known as the fingerboard. And yes, we can put marks and do all sorts of different things, but we can also get fairly accurate. And I have no problem with anybody doing anything, whatever you gotta do to play this thing. But we can actually get fairly accurate um, by practicing these kind of exercises going up and down the bass and just uh, there's something about tying our positions to these harmonics that you know it's almost like my thumb or my fingers become magnetized and find these spots so anyway awesome exercise i'm a fan it's the sort of thing you want to do a little bit every day or every few days. Okay, so spagato, one of the few right hand things that Dennis does in here, and he starts with eight notes, goes down to one. I'll just play it, because I think I can almost get through it uh, with this timing. because I got to focus. <laughs>
I started to kind of lose it there. And that's a good spot to give yourself a little break. <laughs> I give myself a little break, put the bow down. Um, spiccato is one of those skills. I don't think I have the world, I know. <laughs> I don't have the world's greatest spiccato. It's better than it was. It's one of those skills that for me at least, I really have to practice some musical hygiene. So it's kind of like brushing your teeth every day and really check in with it and do it at a variety of speeds and strokes. And I do find this to be a great exercise um, because it's 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 changing up the direction at which you change notes. So you're starting with eight notes, eight repetitions per note, F, 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 G, 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 right, like that. Then seven, so that means that every group of seven um, every new note, every note change is going to be on a different bow. So you're starting down bow, but because it's an odd number, the next one's up bow and so on and so forth. And that goes, that holds true all the way to the end. Um, if you're a beginner, I would highly, or, or early, or th th that seems tricky. I would highly recommend just doing eights maybe for a while. You're get, you're checking in with that skill. All of these exercises can be sl simplified a bit, or you can boil them down to, or, or change the number of octaves you do to make them something that's uh, doable for you. It's like my, like the one I was talking about with running. I, I, I'm gonna hurt myself if I go out and try to run for 10 miles right now. I'm not in, I'm, not, I'm just not built up to that. I used to be <laughs> 15 years ago or something like that, um, but I'll get there again. I know I will, but it takes time. So just think about that with practicing too. Th the workout analogy I think is really valuable. I'm not r paying as much attention to my ratings today. I probably should. Um, one finger vibrato scale. Okay, so I've talked about this one before, maybe just once, but um, or maybe it was on the last two videos, but um, so you have all sorts of different kind things you can do with your vibrato: speed, depth, and tuning. And and all of these use so for a Dennis's idea is to play through this with first finger and second finger. So you could take a and you just go like one one vibrating on both notes. And if you're a beginner, that might be plenty. Okay, so simplify as needed. Don't try to uh, torture yourself with skills you are in the process of learning. We're all in the process of learning. I have to relearn how to do this every day too, to an extent. That's why these are valuable and why this is in here, so. And no matter what speed I'm doing, I'm focusing on even vibrato. I'm going to go into a low thumb position at this point because I'm standing. I often sit also. You just wouldn't know it from these videos because I left my stool <laughs> in Chicago when I moved to San Francisco. And you can see, I'm not trying to maintain any sort of like spacing for this. When I stop vibrating, my thumb will be approximately a whole step from my first finger. These two will just be kind of chilling out, approximately a half step from the first finger, but I'm not really thinking about that. I'm just thinking about being loose and free. And notice I am intentionally maintaining an arch here. I used to pride myself on this and I used to say, I won't do anything unless I can have a perfectly curved finger. As you'll see in some of these later ones today, I uh, have re revise that opinion after talking with a lot of people and working in master classes and I will let this first knuckle buckle which 22 year old Jason would have been extremely disappointed at 44 year old Jason saying that but I find that um, though it is I, I do find it helpful to be able to keep I mean, I do want to be able to have the strength of the arch and I really only let this buckle when I'm doing something a little bit more extended. So the idea just, uh, I'll, I'll uh, move on in a second here is first and second finger going through this, third and fourth finger, although I, I rarely play fourth finger above the G harmonic, so um, I'm not, I haven't made a decision on what I'm gonna do there. And then C is just with the thumb, uh, which is its own special form of mild torture that we can talk about uh, later. <laughs> so, okay, uh, well, I have to dig myself because I barely got through anything there. Um, okay, vomit. This is an exercise that I, I used to practice all the time, and I first learned about it from Jeff Bradditch, who was teaching at Northwestern University at the time. He's now at University of North Texas. I probably don't need to introduce Jeff Bradditch. I'll link to something Jeff-related, if I remember, here. Um, but these are, are exercises were made famous by Gary Carr, and you both, uh, why are they called vomits? It's one, one reason is you're throwing your hand up the string. The other is they make you want to throw up <laughs> when you play them a lot. And, and there is a, a fun, just because they're, they sound kind of moderately sickening. Um, 
And and they there is I remember back in the early '90s at Jeff Bradisich's master classes in at Northwestern at the time, uh, walking in and hearing 30 bass players doing these things in unison, but not quite unison because they're never quite in unison. And it just sounds like this like thing from another universe. Not sure if it's good, not sure if it's bad, but it sure is something. So the way these exercises work, they're very simple, but they have a lot of depth to them. You're going to just go through this pattern. And you're going to do it with a variety of finger combinations. This is a two octave uh, vomit, which is probably too much for a beginner. Although I remember doing these uh, and watching all these beginners do them, but I also remember seeing all sorts of craziness happen. So I, I am definitely in the camp of do things with good technique and less of them and expand it over time. So I'm just going to demonstrate a one octave vomit for you. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to play the first finger for both the low note and the high note. And I think the vomit will come back a lot in Dennis's exercises. So um, I'll be able to expand on this later, but I'm going to turn a drone on and my awesome practice at Modacity actually has this built in. So I'm going to do, this is in B flat. So I'm going to do an F drone, which is the fifth. And that might not be very loud for you, but sorry. Um, it's loud enough, loud enough for me to hear, certainly. Um, you can practice these with or without vibrato. Let me demonstrate without to start. And the fifth is great because there aren't any half-step conflicts. And I am really letting the sound of the slide be a part of the thing. It's like practicing a slide whistle. I'm just trying to like really get into that pocket, not shoot beyond it, just really slide right into that note. So going up to that E flat again. And now, Gary Carr says that these are more, I, or I've heard him say this, I think, uh, these are more of a right hand exercise than a left hand exercise. You think it's left hand, but actually we're, ch we're altering the string length so radically on these that we need to compensate in the bow. So what I'm doing um, is as I go up, I'm actually moving my bow closer to the bridge every time. And so at this point even, the lower note is getting less bow. Because as you move closer to the bridge, you have to move the bow a little bit slower to make it work. So now by the time we go to F, can play it as a harmonic just for safety at first, but you definitely want to practice these close. And you can just put infinite, I'm going to turn that drone off. You can just put infinite uh, repeat brackets around any one of these that you're finding challenging. And that's kind of the way that I approach them. It's kind of dank and damp and uh, here in San Francisco. So my fingerboard's getting a lot of uh, uh, kind of sticky humidity built up on it. That's why I keep wiping it down. Um, then you go down that first, or what I would recommend is then go back down that first octave. Then... Practice the same thing up an octave with the drone, then start to combine them and that kind of thing. We'll talk more about vomits in another video. So, okay, four note progressive scale. Another one of my, I think of these as daily dozen exercises I've done for years. I quit doing vomits just because I got sick of them. <laughs> uh, and then I, I started practicing them last week and I realized I wasn't doing them very well, so I should probably get back into them. They're quite valuable. They get you around the base. This is a is, uh, wonderful exercise because it takes each it takes a set of four notes uh, and then, uh, boy, I should be able to explain this better <laughs> for all these years. Um, you're putting two notes in a position and two notes in a position. So this first cell is going to look like this. And you're just gonna proceed up the bass just like that. So the next group. Uh, 
So the first note in every bar is always going to be one. The last, the highest note is either going to be four or three, depending on where you are register wise. Then, so the next one, so you see here, there's a debate in the bass world going back for probably forever um, about whether to use the fourth finger on F sharp or the third finger. You know, a lot of it depends on your bass size and your hand shape. For me, F sharp starts to feel a little bit awkward on this bass, which by the way is a 1995 Jackstat 7 8 It's kind of a big bass, which is awesome for a lot of things like... Um like low, like low register playing. It's not exactly a solo bass. So some of these exercises that we're doing, I, I guess I'm doing here today, fatigue me a little more than they do on a smaller bass. So I have to take a few more breaks, especially up high. But that's a long way of saying, I like third finger on this bass and with these particular hands. So, so this one I go. Now we have the first group of all whole steps. So one. And then finally we have, hopefully this works. There we go. Um, one, I do, again, I do three. So one, three, two, three. And now you can just keep going up the bass and this exercise actually does all the way up to the high A. Again, if this is new to you, what I just did there is plenty and I actually recommend just stopping on that A until you're feeling it. Thumb position for this particular exercise, Dennis, just so you know what's going on. Dennis continues the two notes, two notes kind of exercise. At this point, it is also possible to play all four notes uh, in one position. But, and sometimes you wanna do that, but there are a lot of times when you do wanna be able to shift up there too. So you just wanna have that flexibility. So again, this exercise, I recommend practicing with a drone. I put the drone on the fifth, we're in A major. So this would be an E and again, don't go fast. Again, separate notes maybe as you're starting is a great way to do it. And just do it as many times as you need to until you feel like this particular word in your musical vocabulary is kind of happening. Next group, over time, start to slur two notes. Start to slur four. I go into low thumb position. And then flip it around. Slowly get faster over time. Feel free to absolutely use a metronome, although frankly, I, I don't um, when I'm starting a new exercise like this um, because I, I wanna give myself the flexibility to slow things way down without having something clicking at me. Um, although certainly I practice these with the metronome and there are a ton of variations that I, I will show you another time because we will run into this exercise in the future, I am sure. Um, three note progressive scale, same idea as the four note, except now we are um, only doing three notes, which adds its own challenges because three notes are an odd grouping. Just like it's talking about with the spiccato exercise and the odd groupings, that's always a little more challenging. The same is true here um, because we're shifting every couple notes. So this is a great exercise to just demonstrate good shifting technique, which is when you're going up, this is so confusing to talk about on, on, uh, on cello and bass. Up is down and down is up, right? And I think you probably know this. So when I say let's go up the bass, I actually mean let's go down towards the floor, right? So I'm always talking about in pitch. So when we go up the bass, meaning toward the floor, um, we wanna shift on a low finger, like one. When we go up the bass, or when we go down the bass, meaning up, whew, so confusing, we wanna shift on a high number. So we don't wanna go. Okay, now, sometimes we do. Depends on what music, these rules are all made to be broken, but just best practices for fingering. So this three, 
note progressive scale I find particularly great at uh, teaching good shifting skills up and down the bass. And again, this is an A major, the vomit was in B flat major. I practice these in every single key. I practice these on every string. Yes, even the E string one, I'm feeling like uh, having a, <laughs> when I'm feeling like challenging myself, I guess. I guess. Um, feel free to uh, bracket the, uh, to put like infinite repeat marks in, in, on these uh, just to get comfortable with each set. Now, the thing that is different for this one is that you, your um, the transition between patterns is a little bit different than the fours, and it's just the nature of three notes. So what Dennis does here is so he goes one. Now the next bar starts with the finger you just starts with the four. So that. That's it's one of those things that might seem confusing because you could do you could go to one, but you're actually you're actually uh, making life harder for yourself. Are you though? Yeah, well, I'd, I have to think about that. Anyway, regard. You can do lots of different things, but whenever I'm working out of something that's new, whether it's the Raboff book, the Petraki book, uh, some Mandel, these incredibly useful exercises, any material like that, I like to kind of live in that person's world and follow what they've laid out. And then over time, I'll take what I like and I'll mix it together and that's just music and bass playing in life, right? So, but but as I'm doing this, I, I do try to be strict with what I'm seeing or as str strict as I can within what I can do. So. I'm I am, that's a very long way of saying, I am gonna do this fingering. So, uh, one, one, four. 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 And you can hear that I'm taking a little bit of extra time on these notes that are not in the pattern. I'm just like giving my brain a second to like really focus on that, on that, like it's like I was reading an unfamiliar word. Just giving myself a little bit of time to think about that. And then I find if I practice that way, um, just getting it into tempo is quite uh, easy. And whenever I, you saw I took a little bit of time and I think it was the C sharp. It's just good to, that's a good, I find that to be good practice. I would normally be getting kind of tired right here because I've been talking so much. I, uh, uh, my hands are still okay, but because I've been talking so much, my mouth's getting dry. So I'm gonna go get a drink of water. Uh, and what else? This plant's got a pretty cool new branch. Um, I'm gonna shoot a little bit of video for this Practisma practice journal. Here's Dennis's book. Don't know why I have that out, except it's awesome. And I do wanna get the uh, physical versions of all these. I just, as you can see, we don't have a lot of space here in the in the Heath house. Uh, this is this is it. This is our like multi-purpose room. Bathroom's over there. Got some beer brewing right in here. Here's the bedroom. Uh, Outdoor space, got a nice outdoor space, but this is just what you got in San Francisco. So it's one of the disadvantages of living in San Francisco. So anyway, okay, got a little water, uh, stretch it out. And now Clark thumb drills. So what this is, is um, this is this is very cool. Uh, it is a, how do I describe this? It is a, uh, it's a trumpet exercise that, uh, he's got a description here, that um, you hear if, you've, if you spent any time in a music school, uh, you would hear this, and many of you probably haven't, but um, this is also a very useful exercise for bass just because it incorporates some string crossing. And then what Dennis is doing here is he's giving you three different hand frames, I guess. Yeah, three different hand frames, starting with the first finger on the on the first note, the, no, I'm sorry, uh, that's what you're leaving down. So uh, starting with the thumb on the first note, the first finger on the first note and the second finger on the first note. And so we wanna be as efficient as possible with these. These are really useful for all different kinds of playing. Even if you don't think you're gonna spend a lot of time in thumb position, I recommend these. Uh, and again, I go, I go slow.
example of if you're looking at my first finger, sometimes I'm curved, sometimes I'm, I'm letting it go this way a little bit just so it kind of maintains contact with the string. Um, again, I used to be obsessed with always being curved and I think that actually, while I, I do think that's a good thing to be obsessed about probably for a, a period of time in your life, I do think that if you just allow this to buckle, this first joint while still maintaining strength here, I do think that gives you some possibilities. I. I, th uh, I, I, I think. So anyway, so you go through that fingering, trying to be as efficient as possible. Everything is staying down where appropriate. So again, I'll play it a little faster as you can see. Now you go to first finger and now we have a different, different orientation for the notes. go to second finger. And then you go back to the thumb. And now, I'm not uh, amazed with my intonation on that, so a drone would also be good on this. And again, we're in D major, so droning on the fifth is my preference. So I put an A on, and I just go slow and listen for pitch. Even that sounds a little sharp. Maybe not a little sharp in general today. You can see I'm taking my time making sure that I'm really, now this one, and I can always put those imaginary repeat brackets around anything I need to. Um, and, and with, with, with time speed will come on these. They're great exercises. You can do them on different strings. You can do them in different keys. I am a big fan for sure. Um, bumblebees. This is something I have never spent any time practicing in my life. And I've been, uh, deeply unimpressed with my intonation on these, but I've gotten slightly better. I was actually, pr okay, so the idea, this is a cello uh, exercise, um, uh, co the Cosman studies. This is something that, again, if you have been to music school or spend any time around uh, cellists, really, you, you, you may have heard this. It's a very uh, well-known uh, warm exercise. It's something that Gary Carr practices a lot, and I feel, I feel uh, kind of embarrassed that I'm so crappy at this because I just, um, but, but the idea is you are starting with everything uh, in chromatic, like uh, in a chromatic position. So thumb is on D, one is on E flat, two is on E, and three is on F. And you're going like this. So thumb three, two, three. That's the first pattern right there. Then we go on to the next pattern. We're gonna do E flat. So thumb three. One, three. And then, uh, whoops. Uh, then thumb two, one, two. And then, and then I'll zoom out, I promise. Then you move the thumb down to C sharp, which I'm taking a lot of time making sure that I'm in tune. Then the pattern repeats itself. Down at, make sure that's it. And I, you know, something that uh, I'm doing a lot in this volume three that I recommend anybody do, if, and you've seen me do it a few times, when in doubt, drop it down an octave and check, or check with a harmonic. Do not get into the mystery zone, scrambling and that sort of stuff, and not being sure if you're in tune or not. This exercise, um, I guess I'm probably not gonna play it very uh, through very smoothly today, because I'm, I'm talking through it so much, but. 
like, well, here's an example. I'll do that first, those first couple of bars, and this is how I would recommend practicing this. Checking with everything around you. So you can kind of see, it's almost like I've got an, ex, uh, an accelerator or lever or something. It's like, once I get the pattern, I might accelerate a little bit just to get the fingers moving. I might, and then I, I am right now slowing it back down as I make the transition. So it's all about trust but verify. You get the idea with that. Again, this is, this is, I would call this not a beginner. <laughs> I would call this not a beginner exercise. This is not a, I'll just say it. This is not a beginner exercise, in my opinion. Um, if that freaks you out, that register, you may want to just move on from bumblebees. Or maybe, if you do want to modify it, there are always good ways to modify it. Maybe start, uh, maybe just start this pattern right here that's starting on open G. You know, you could go like. And maybe just take that. Um, there's there's always a way to, so even though I, ta I take it back, yes, this is a more advanced exercise, but yes, there is a way to simplify this to whatever level you're on. So yes, I think so. Um, okay, fourth position expander. I This is one that I am le even less familiar with than bumblebees. Again, not for good reason. Um, this may uh, mess with your brain if you're not used to thinking about the bass this way. So the idea is we are going to take and expand uh, this span. I'm just kind of generalizing here, but we're going to practice opening and closing while keeping our thumb on the harmonic. Now, the good news is the low note is always G. So all of these exercises, if you're having a hard time getting them in your ear, you can always do them down an octave. So I'm gonna play a little bit at the beginning. And again, this the point of this exercise is, is um, we're developing a quick and accurate extension and contraction in fourth position. Dennis also talks about intonation here. Um, yeah, resist the urge to stop if the notes aren't particularly in tune. There is a difference between exercising a quick finger action and exercising precise tuning. This exercise produces the best results if you focus on developing quick and flexible fingers rather than an exact tuning. Yes, I fully agree. But I, 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 can't, <laughs> I can't go fast yet because it has to be, for me, it has to be at least somewhat close to the right pitch. So I'm gonna go slow today, but we got a lot more of these videos coming, so my speed will increase. This might be kind of like your speed if you're new to this. And again, trust but verify. I got a harmonic there so I can check. Okay, now I might just take that little bit and now try it without any interruptions. And if I was a beginner, that might be more than enough. Or maybe don't even do it up there. Maybe just try it down an octave. These all work great down an octave. And now try the same thing up an octave. I say that that's, so the notes I'm playing are G, B, C. That's about, that's about, uh, that's something that most people are going to be able to get without too much uh, challenge. The next note, even though it's just a half step, and part of that might be the size of my, ja my jack stat, my big old seven eighths bass, to get that, that perfect fourth. That is a, a uh, that is wide for my hand. And you can see my finger is much more extended. I'll tell you though, I've only been, this is maybe my fourth time going through this exercise and I've really not done much like this, but this is, <laughs> believe it or not, this is going way better than it was last week when I was pulling these out. So yes, you can teach an old dog new tricks. Um, so you go up to that point that was uh, G, C, 
I am recording, right? Sorry, I'm so paranoid about this program. ScreenFlow. Um, am I recording? Sorry. Maybe I'm not recording. Oh, this program drives me insane. Is it not recording? Uh, I must be recording, right? There's no way it's not. Oh, it's recording. Okay. Sorry about that. Sorry about that. I'll keep going. I just, I, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm getting a new Mac. <laughs> I'm going to order it to, today, I think, or tomorrow. Probably should do it today. And I'm just not, I, I do not trust this computer um, for to, to do anything. Mm. So anyway, yes, we are recording. So um, G to C, uh, thumb to one. Now we do thumb two, three for D flat. So C to... And then... And now the, here's where um, I am supremely bad at this because uh, I just haven't worked on it uh, mainly. And I have really not developed a great two, three. Um, that's, a, that's a fingering that most people have a little bit of trouble with. I think this exercise will, will do wonders for me <laughs> to develop that. Um, just real quick, because I'm almost out of time. Uh, he then has you do a similar thing with a whole step going up. So you're going to be like a... And then he has you uh, do a... Pa a connection pattern here, starting to measure 19, like. And then you go through a, a variety of permutations. So then you make it um, minor. So now it's, it, he drops, drops the B down to B flat. And then, um, and then just a little bit of a kind of like loop-de-loop -loop pattern here for the last thing. So like a... And I always need a break after I do this, but I talk through it so much that I, I'm okay. But if, if you're pl playing along in real time, uh, <laughs> I, you might want to take a break. Okay, so trills. This is a great exercise, and Dennis is going to have videos for all these out. He definitely has one out for these, so I'll just... Um, I'll try to remember to link up to his trill videos so he can just explain the concept of even and odd trills. He's just got them in the lower octave for this one, which is actually great in this pattern because I, we've spent so much time in the upper register. So uh, let's go, um, let's do some trills. So the idea for these is you're going to want to do a forearm motion, not a typing motion. You have two general kind of overall motions on the base on the, for, for left hand. We're simplifying, but you have this kind of thing, which is really digital. And I think of that as like typing. And then you have this rotational, which I think of as like, you know, opening, opening a door or something like that. So it's pronation kind of motion. And so this exercise, we're going to do the, uh, that. We're going to do that second, that ladder motion. So it's going to be like... <laughs> centering. He always has you center. And I just think about bringing my energy right back to here. Just kind of reset, little reset button. I try to think about lengthening, really feeling like I'm, I'm tall. I'm a little bit of that athletic pose, leaning just a little bit forward. Now variation A. Uh, and again, I'll, uh, Dennis will explain this more eloquently than me. So just check out his videos for the concept behind these. <laughs> And now, B, we're going to do some uh, triplets. And I would always 
always rather hear slower but cleaner. So if that's too fast for you, it very well might be. You might be blazing beyond me in terms of speed, but keep that clarity and you always wanna be able to hear that, that finger percussion. That's the key for these. And this is something, I think is in this one, he talks about how he practices this while he's just driving around on his arm. That is a good exercise, just to kind of, you don't need to be on the base to do uh, these exercises. C, now we're doing eights. Uh, just focus on really making sure you're playing exactly what's on the page, especially as you get more uh, notes in the exercise. <laughs> incredibly good uh, coordination exercises. And now uh, the the odd trills, again, Dennis can explain it uh, on his video. But think about that pronation. Whoops, hi, I screwed up. So Modacity has this really cool function where every 50 minutes or whatever interval you set, I think you can change that, it will remind you to take a break. That is a really cool thing, but I'm not going to take a break because I'm just going to power through uh, the hour. But that would be a good point to take a break. 50 minutes or 25 minutes. 50 uh, seems to be really good for me for practicing. Um, so anyway, uh, you go through that and do groups of seven, which can be fairly challenging, fives and sevens, and it's really good stuff. But the timer's just about to go off, so we'll move on. Um, Okay, Professor Paul, that is Paul Ellison, the wonderful bass professor at Rice University. Um, these double exercise, exercise, double stop <laughs> exercises are really cool. And Dennis recommends that you practice them pizzicato first. Pizzicato is brutally honest for these. So what we're doing is we're doing a bar, four and four, which if you just do your poor pinky, um, don't do that. that I, I, I mean, you can, I guess, but I always think of three and four as a unit, especially for any sort of feat of strength like this. This is, this is definitely going to take more, uh, um, it's just, uh, you need a firmer, ah, that's probably a bad word, left-hand approach. It's just a different approach. And then the next one is going to be, so it's this one right here. Then we go, so we've gone four, 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 two, one. And notice that one is barred and I'm helping out with third finger. But then when I go to this one, D flat. And so um, the, the left one, the left fingering refers to the lower string. I have three and four on the D string and two and one there. Now, for the next one, I move second finger over. So that is. Then we have A flat D. Then we have a fifth. Then we have two barred, then one. And give your left hand a break. This is definitely a um, take it in little chunks. And then that goes back down the fingerboard. So up in direction, I know it's confusing. Uh, and you just slowly open up the hand. So this is going to be like. Down a half step. Oh, memory, sorry, I gotta look. There it is, kind of, again. Once these are memorized, they're pretty intuitive. This is like almost memorized for me. Then. And one of the things I love about this, this whole volume three is that uh, Dennis is, is, is introducing some things that I, I do 
a lot. Like I do all that stuff a lot in orchestral music and solo playing and all kinds of situations, but I don't necessarily practice it a lot. So I do think it's really important to, um, that's another thing that I just love about this approach. So if you practice a pizzicato, if you're like me, you'll find that it's actually a little bit easier to do arco. Like the bow kind of hides, in a way it sort of hides some of the flaws, but it also makes diagnosing the flaws more challenging. That's my, that's my take on it. So then you add the bow. And again, if you're beginning, or even if you've played for a while and these are new to you, that might be plenty, just that one line, but we'll go on. slurring. You can do them on other strings. It's the great thing about all of these exercises or just how I approach practicing in general. It's there's there it takes simple things and just infinite variety on these on these fundamental concepts is that's the game to me. Uh, okay, thumb position hand shapers. Okay, so this is I believe uh, Dennis probably got this from the Petrocchi book. Yeah, Franco Petrocchi, who I met in person two years ago in Italy. It was super cool. It was like meeting one of my heroes. Simplified Higher Technique, his book is totally amazing. You should totally pick it up. I should do a review on that book. I never have. There are a lot, but um, but I'm doing this right now, so we'll we'll save that. Um, yes, bumblebees. It's kind of like a s not s yeah, kind of maybe a little simpler, a similar definitely exercise to bumblebees. So the idea is you're going to be in what's called a semi-chromatic hand position. You got three general hand positions. You've got diatonic, and we're just pretending that we're, let's pretend we're on the note G. So diatonic would be G, A, B, C. Semi-chromatic would be G, A, B flat, B. Semi-chromatic being whole step, and these are half steps. Fully chromatic, G, a flat, A, B flat. I'll demonstrate on the bass. So diatonic, which we're not doing in this, but just for your info. Right, it's like the white keys on the piano, G, A, B, C. Semi-chromatic. I think of that as sort of like my default hand position. If I'm just gonna be in a hand position, in thumb position, it's gonna be a whole step here and half steps here. Then, fully chromatic. So, this is uh, uh, alternating between chromatic and semi-chromatic, and then the thumb moves up a note. So, it starts, uh, I, I know I can flip the iPad, but I'm more, I just don't trust this screen capture program on my laptop, so I'm just gonna leave it like this and move it around. So now we have semi-chromatic. Now the thumb moves up, and then this moves. Now this moves. So it's like you're slowly inching your way up the bass. You're just kind of going like this with your hand. So I'll play a little bit without talking. <laughs> Trust but verify. And now, at this point, so this D, we have certain dividing lines on the bass. This G is traditionally the dividing line between thumb position and lower positions. Although we can have lower thumb position, we can do all sorts of things, but that's a general dividing line. The D, uh, uh, David Allen Moore talks about this. I will try to remember to link up to an excellent video he has talking about, about these sort of concepts on Discover Double Bass. 
awesome channel. I hope you're following. And uh, this D right here is kind of the division point where you want to stop using three and kind of start using two. And, and the reason why is because your hand, this may be hard to see on the GoPro, but your hand has a little bit more of this kind of cant when you're pointing this way. And as you go up the bass, your hand starts to kind of point this way a little bit. Third finger, which is quite convenient right here, starts to actually become a little bit, I would have to have a second camera for you to see, uh, what actually becomes a little bit of a reach to get around. So second finger becomes a little more practical. Also, the notes are so close together that thumb one, two actually rocks for, for these sort of positions. So, uh, and I'll demonstrate this on another video, but as you, when you hit this D, you'll start to often find that you may, depending, everyone's different, you may want to consider replacing third finger with second finger and doing just everything with thumb one, two primarily. It can work quite well. So that's a very cool exercise that is not going awesome right now, but it's new, so I'll get better. Okay, oh, and there's a whole other one I ignored. We'll do that in another video. Finger replacements, this is a fun one. This is a, both fun and highly useful in orchestra or anywhere, but especially orchestra. So the idea is we want to be able to, and I think I've talked through this one, so I'll just kind of get into it, but you, we want to be able to uh, swap out fingers on the same note with minimal sonic uh, distortion. So I'm gonna, this is how this exercise goes. I'll just play through it. center and you can do that again. Um, I would on a scale of one to 10, that would probably be about a four in my book. Um, I'm having this tendency, just, just be honest here, folks. Um, I just tendency to kind of like pulse the notes. That would be a little bit more what I want and have it smooth. I have an exercise I've had students do a lot where you take a note. I'm going to just take this E. and you replace the fingers. And that, uh, it just, if you're were walking by somebody practicing that, it might just sound like they didn't know how to hold a pitch, but that can be a very useful exercise. This one from Dennis, excuse me. This one from Dennis is uh, more thought out <laughs> than what I have students do. So I like it. You get the idea, we're moving on. Okay, Tetrachord, Mark Whitney, these exercises are really cool. And they're another thing that, uh, so he uh, was uh, Dennis's bass teacher in Baylor. I love these, these asides and stories. Play forte always, lead the shifts with the elbow, not the hand, that's very important. We'll have to do a video about that. So many things we could talk about, but not today. So the idea with these is you are starting with a major tetrachord. Tetrachord is just four notes, right? The first four notes of a scale. I think I was searching for that word <laughs> earlier in this video. So we're gonna start E flat major, one, four, two, four, right here. That will remind you of the four note progressive scale if you remember back to like a half hour ago. Now, we are going to change it to minor. So we were doing one, four, two, four. Now we're going to do one, four, one, four. And by the way, uh, again, check when possible. There's a harmonic over that, under that G flat, A flat. There's a harmonic there. So just make sure that you are in, in tune. Now, 
one, two, one, four. So, so far we've just changed one note every time. Now, one, two, two, four. And now this one, I believe, um, yeah, we change a couple notes. So now we do, we do a whole tone scale. Now, and this confused me because it looked like an E sharp to me. It's not. We've just moved from E flat major to E major. Now we're back to a major tetrachord. And we go through the whole process again. I'll play through as much as I can get through in 55, 53 seconds. Here we go from the beginning. be harmonically weird it's harmonically weird for me because this is new but just those those uh, modulations might freak you out at first FYI I'll start an E major again whole tone now F major And again, you could do these on any string. You could start on a different note. You could um, change the bowing. You could just go up. That's, that's going to destroy you in a hurry, probably. Or just go down. I remember Bruce Bransby at Indiana University doing all that sort of uh, stuff, which is pretty cool. Okay, virtuoso arpeggios. If you ever wanted to play music by Bottazzini or Dragonetti or any of these people, um, this pattern will do it for you. It's classic bass player stuff. One fingering that's quite interesting, and I don't know how I, I've been playing bass for 31 years, and I've never thought to do this fingering on this arpeggio. It's very cool. Um, we'll get there when we get there. I'll just start at the beginning and we'll see how far we can go. So this is building up the ability to play three octave G, D, and A arpeggios with ease, okay? Uh, which is something that the uh, 19th century virtuoso bass music was full of. Um, yeah, and so it's good to be able to know how to do this. So we start here. And do this as many times as it takes to feel comfortable, feel free to take a break if you need to. I would suggest following these fingerings because they build on each other. Yes, you could do this in a, probably five different ways that would also work, but that will be the building blocks that you need. So that's the D, D triad or D co chord uh, there, I guess. And then now, this will feel weird at first if it's new to you. Possibly. Now. You get the idea. And now we start here. Now here's this fingering that I think is super cool. Um, I don't know why I never thought about this before. Thumb, one. Which, by the way, there's a harmonic there. It's the only non-harmonic note in the lick. There is a harmonic, but it's the wrong octave. So you got to play this closed. Then Dennis has three, four. Why did I never think of that? I would always go thumb, one, two, three. And then my one gets all displaced. This feels much neater. So this exercise starts again. as the D. Now we pop up here. Same idea. And now you start to tie them together. So B is going to be uh, just a little bit more tied together. Um, I'm going to do that that fingering right there. Oh, 
crappers. What is that next one? Um, <laughs> uh, time's up, oh no! Then A, uh, and so on and so forth. We will talk more about that on another video, but I think it is time for silence. I highly encourage you to try adding silence at the end of your practice sessions. I am totally digging that. I don't know why I didn't do that before. Um, but yeah, so that's a, that's a look inside of, of that one. I'm just exiting out here, going back to the GoPro app, which is hopefully still running. Yay, it is. Okay, good. Uh, so yeah, uh, it went from clouds to sun to clouds back here in San Francisco. Gonna do a little work in the garden. Uh, it's about an hour, right? Takes me about an hour. That one takes me maybe 45 minutes to an hour, um, depending on, on how much repetition I do. This one, I do find when I'm not talking through it like this, my normal practice time, it's a little more physically intensive than some of the other than, than uh, routines number one and two. I am definitely getting a lot out of this. Uh, and, and so I recommend, um, I mean, I hate to say go buy 16 books. Maybe just get one and, and see how it goes. But I would, I would, uh, here, and again, I've got a lot more of these to do, but I would recommend just picking one and trying it rather than getting Dennis's volume 17. Uh, and again, get as many as you want, but but I think that guy, him guiding with his experience you through these exercises, that's where the magic lies in these. And it's really interesting to me to kind of frame my technique through someone else's eyes. It's been a while, honestly, since I've done that to this extent. So I'm digging it and I'm gonna build the playlist for volume four. All right, thanks folks.